my brother lives in Singapore, and I thought as a kind of reminder of the material effects um, of both disaster and rapacious economic um, practices uh, that, that don't respect national borders um, or investment uh, contingencies, I'd put the picture up um, that his uh, wife sent me um, from the view in her 11th story office window in Singapore from just over a week ago. That's the green frog there. Um, and it's the material kind of effects that are going to relate to this more methodological talk. Um, I work in the area of post-colonial literary studies and in particular the intersection of post-colonialism and environmental criticism. So this means looking at how different forms of colonialism are represented in literary texts in both social and environmental terms and relating this to specific economic practices and distributions of wealth. And these concerns are very much at the heart of the first book I've written on post-colonial tourism which looked at how literary texts critique neo-colonial development practices on one hand, um, but on the other hand also illuminate pathways towards more sustainable tourism futures. And one of the limit points I came up against um, when I was trying to define the more emancipatory dimensions of literary representations of tourism, centered on how free market capitalism is bound up in inevitable moments of crisis and disaster, the movements of which have been described most devastatingly in recent years by Naomi Klein in the shock doctrine, the rise of disaster capitalism. So given that I use tourism under the sign of disaster as a means of testing and problematizing some of the more hopeful readings in that book, it's been a kind of natural progression for me to look more closely at how a number of real-world disasters are represented in post-colonial texts. And this is the subject of my current research project and of my talk today. I've just done a quick outline of the sort of things that I look at here on the next slide. So really I look at, um, at how a variety of post-colonial disaster representations following World War II can help humanize and add cultural and historical depth to our understandings of disasters, social and environmental effects. Um, you can see I cover a very wide range of regions here. Um, and the project looks at the, the various ways in which post-colonial texts dramatize tensions between decolonization, globalization and neocolonialism in a period that witnessed both an explosion in the number and effects of disasters and the emergence of disaster studies as an academic field. Um, you can see kind of the context for this explosion of the number of disasters on this UN graph here. Um, so following 1945, this massive rise in, these are climactic disasters um, on the, the black line, um, which are obviously related to climate change, and you can link it into economic globalization um, and vulnerabilities in this kind of period of decolonization, neocolonialism. Um, you can also see on this slide kind of these sort of reductive economic graphs that you get from the UN kind of summarizing the damage in the last 12 years. But we're living in this age of kind of general disaster at the moment. Um, the project has kind of a lot to say really to, to issues of vulnerability um, in relation to the current moment. Um, and the general argument that I make is that literature and film provide conceptual resources that can help challenge disaster capitalism, foster resilience, and reinforce disaster studies commitment to reducing vulnerability. So, I'm interested in both the, the social um, construction of natural disasters and the environmental consequences of social disasters. Um, and in most cases, how post-colonial disasters can never be reduced to singular events, but represent entwined processes of social, historical, and environmental vulnerability that are in most cases better understood as complex emergencies or compound disasters. There's a definition there at the top of the slide. Economics looms large in these considerations for a number of reasons. If the World Bank's clear awareness, as its website puts it, that developing countries suffer most from disasters doesn't give us pause, then quotations from progressive disaster sociologists such as Bob Bullen surely must. And I'm looking here at the, the third quotation down here. He says, the imposition of free market discipline through structural adjustment programs has not only deepened inequality, social fragmentation, and environmental dispossession, but has also increased vulnerability to hazards through environmental degradation, magnified losses from disasters, and increased recovery difficulties in the post-disaster period. However, this kind of observation is rarely joined up in disaster research to any sustained reckoning with colonialism, either in its past or present forms, and would clearly benefit from being connected to the more systemic arguments such as those put forward by Naomi Klein. In fact, I read the shock doctrine partly as post-colonial critique given the regions it covers, so moving from Latin America through South Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, and also in light of its tacit interest in new or transmuted forms of colonialism. Where Klein's work is really useful in relation to this is in mapping the ideological tactics that entwine post-World War II disasters with the global spread of neoliberal doctrine, 
something that's again not very prominent in mainstream disaster studies approaches, but which many post-colonial texts necessarily register as they deal with the issues of ecological transformation and environmental racism. Um, I assume everyone in the audience is kind of familiar with the general argument of Klein's book, um, but it essentially states that neoliberal free market hegemony has been attained on a global level following World War II through the system systematic exploitation of disasters. Rather than progressing through an invisible hand, free market fundamentalism is a form of violent labor that involves targeting crisis-shocked populations in the wake of social and natural catastrophes. And this means that Bolin's observation, the, the, the middle of the slide there, um, about how free market discipline exa exacerbates recovery difficulties needs reorienting, um, as the ongoing vulnerabilities he describes are part of disaster capitalism's logic. So they're deliberately exacerbated so as to help manufacture future disasters, which in turn can be economically exploited. And that produces an even darker variant um, on the climate-related rise of disasters on that graph I showed you, um, because that rise can be read as products of neoliberal fiscal policy. So if we consider these points in the context of colonial histories and ongoing manifestations, it's clear that such disastrous engineering puts huge pressure on how key disaster studies concepts, such as post-disaster recovery, are conceptualized. How do we assess the post in post-disaster um, in post-colonial contexts? And recovery. I'm thinking here in particular about what recovery means in places like Haiti where the pre-disaster paradigm involved a situation in which the whole country existed in a position of enforced poverty, contributing to long-term processes of ecological destruction um, and social disenfranchisement. And linked to this, there's barely any attention to the connections between notions of health in both individual and syst uh, systemic terms and the production and prolongation of disaster. So terms like disability are virtually absent from mainstream dis sociological disaster studies, along with identity politics and nuanced historicization more generally. So I think Klein's work offers one way of helping to transform this when read alongside more progressive forms of disaster research that tend to be grounded in materialist methods. It raises the question, for me at least, of what would happen if we treat post-colonial studies as disaster studies and vice versa, with an emphasis on the shaping influence of colonialisms on a global scale. Um, and this involves embedding the kind of perspectives generated through Mike Davis's notion of the dialectic of ordinary disaster and the systemic economic inequalities and environmental victimizations that Rob Nixon describes under the rubric of slow violence. I've got a definition there if you're not familiar with his work. It also asks us to think carefully about the resilience of what historian and anthropologist Anne Stoller calls imperial formations. And this is a term she uses to register the ongoing quality of processes of decimation, displacement, and reclamation that remain active outside of formal imperialism and create repositories of vulnerabilities that last longer than the political structures that produce them. Returning to Naomi Klein's work in this light, one thing that I find both frustrating and enticing about the book is that it gives no clear economic analysis of how people might negotiate the process of post-disaster ex expropriation, ruination, and abandonment for materially transformative ends. Rather, it ends quite pragmatically, if problematically, with the image of people healing themselves. Um, I've just kind of got the, the conclusion there on the slide and highlighting some of the bits that I think are kind of problematic. Um, this conclusion reflects how Klein's book tends to be more diagnostic than future-oriented, and is generally more interested in lamenting the brutal effacement of Keynesian mixed economies than reflecting on pathways towards economic liberation. And it's precisely this that I'm interested in when thinking about how disasters, both the, in the immediate and longer term aftermath, need not only be opportunities for disaster capitalists, but also for the people and communities such processes exploit. And there are historical and literary examples we can learn from in strengthening collective resources in this respect. And it's here that I want to move, um, move on to the play on disaster capitalism, my title, and bring in post-capitalist economic theory in support of a methodological approach to reading post-colonial post disaster representations. So it's part of a reading strategy, really. I'm especially interested in this respect by the work instigated by feminist economists Julie Graham and Catherine Gibson, who published collaboratively under the title J.K. Gibson Graham. So for Gibson Graham, a post-capitalist approach to economics represents what they call a politics of possibility, 
which in its initial iteration in the late 90s, drew on post-structuralist theory and the real-world successes of feminism in challenging patriarchy in order to attempt a parallel denaturalization of capitalism as a totalizing practice. I think this speaks directly to John's question at the end of the last panel. This can be aligned both with, what, with um, the alternative development school espoused by commentators such as Arturo Escobar and with post-colonial thinking more broadly. As Gibson Graham acknowledged, and this is the quote at the, the center of this, this slide, the pressure to recognize that livelihoods are sustained by a plethora of economic activities that do not take the form of wage labor, commodity production for a market, or capitalist enterprise has come largely from the global south. And they're quite fond of using this kind of, again, sort of fairly reductive iceberg image um, just to illustrate the fact that there's a lot of different kinds of economic practices that don't fit within um, a capitalist framework as they define it. You can find out more if you just go to the website, Community Economies. Um, essentially, their project involves its own form of subaltern recovery, as, in, as, uh, as it tries, in their words, to make visible the hidden and alternative activities that everywhere abound, and to connect them through a language of economic, economic difference. If we begin to see non-capitalist activities as prevalent and viable, we may be encouraged here and now to actively build on them. So keeping this in mind, there's a couple of reasons why I find post-capitalist thinking empowering with respect to confronting both disaster capitalism and the repositories of vulnerability that Stoller associates with particular imperial formations. One is that, as a direct obverse to disaster capitalism, Post-capitalist inquiry involves focusing on moments of potential associated with the new and contingent forms of community that are often enacted in the aftermath of disastrous events. So when Gibson go and talk about building on alternative economic possibilities, they're speaking partly to the language of conceptual as well as material reconstruction that accompanies disasters, and which can lead to emancipatory as well as exploitative consequences depending on distributions of power. Their numerous case studies also represent a range of post-colonial and post-industrial situations in which economic diversity is enacted in the wake of conditions that reflect the states of abandonment or the abandonment of the state that is entwined with particular disasters. So these include, for example, the gutted out regional economy of the La Trobe Valley in Australia, the plight of Basque separatist communities in Spain, inversions, inversions of economic dependency theory in Kiribati, and further examples from Kerala and the Philippines. And the key, key task in learning from each of these cases, as Gibson Graham see it, is to help elucidate new discursive framings that allow non-capitalist economic relations to be actively cultivated in daily life, characterized as it is by the dialectics of ordinary disaster that are embedded in so many global societies. Alongside this, there's an opportunity to highlight how creative environmental, economic, and social justice activities are locally expressed and to share insights across cultures and contexts. Another interesting aspect of Gibson's, Gibson Graham's work is that, it produce, is, um, is that the procedures they outline for achieving progressive economic transformations have distinctly literary resonances. Um, so they see these new discursive framings as being constituted by what they call techniques of rereading, techniques of creativity, concepts that suggest clear analogues with literary analysis in terms of how storytelling relates to broader functions of the imaginary and processes of social and environmental transformation. And you can see from the language here, so this rereading creativity, why this might appeal to a literary critic in general. Um, I've got a couple of defini definitions there, again, on the slide. So they're interested in, in um, refusing to give coherence to capitalism as an economic totality, uncovering what's possible but obscure to imbue, um, adopting stances of curiosity rather than recognition, um, looking for future possibilities in light of a differentiating imagination. And this emphasis on the imagination, I think, is really interesting. Um, where their work gets a bit more confusing, for me at least, is in its commitment to weak theory and what seems to me to be a co correspondingly amorphous notion of politics. They present post-capitalist research as an ethical project that opens up non-totalizing possibilities for progressive economic futures that emerge through multiple forms rather than a single class-based ideology in the style of Marxism, although the des desirable outcome may display similar features. Um, I've got a kind of summary, like you can, if you're getting bored of me speaking, just read the summary here of kind of how they outline this, uh, but I won't go through it because it's quite detailed. Um, what's not clear to me anyway while that's in the background um, is how they account for differential histories, for co culturally localized perspectives, for multiple indices of oppression, for environmental specificity and exhaustion, and for world systemic analysis. 
And it's partly for this reason, or these reasons, that I think their fieldwork-based methods could be complemented by analysis of aesthetic texts that register the uneven effects of disaster capitalism and state abandonment, and address tensions between economic diversity and multi-directional power structures. And this is not least as literary text frequently presents situations in which creative economic negotiation is fundamental to the everyday texture of human environmental relations. So addressing such representations in culturally and historically situated terms can allow us to think through the provocative ramification, ramifications of Gibson Graham's claim that even in the process of people being rendered disposable, it's always possible, this is the final quotation on the slide, it's always possible that exclusion from a dominant economic calculus might liberate new subjectivities and alternative forms of economic being. And at this point, I can't help but think of texts like J.M. Kutzia's The Life and Times of Michael Kay or Alexis Wright's Carpenteria, both of which are brilliant for thinking through post-colonial economics in relation to civil conflict, apartheid politics, and bare life on one hand, um, and in relation to a particular form of indigenous opposition to extractive industry on the other. In making this argument and focusing on the historical and material negotiations of chronic disaster in many different Western locations, as non-Western locations, I want to push back quite deliberately against the future anterior logic of certain forms of risk analysis. Rather than just imagining the effects of future crises, it seems important also to examine how these relate to, the, to context, contexts where experiences of compound disaster are constitutive of, constitutive of everyday life, and how the stories that emerge from these also help confront generic na narratives of capitalist hegemony. The kinds of emergent or imagined economic interactions I find interesting are ones that, which do not presuppose crisis as essential to their logic in the way that capitalism classically does, or which function as empowering responses to the very crises that necessarily proliferate in the context of late capital capitalism. And this demands forms of literary analysis that focus on the function of genre, so on how literary texts negotiate the obvious connection between disaster and tragedy, for instance, and how they operate less as anatomies of crises than as forms of definition that help us to see political, social, and economic alternatives, even in situations of deep privation. As the retrenchments that have followed the global financial crisis continue, and vulnerability to any number of social and environmental crises likewise spirals outwards, it seems crucial to look at alternatives to the dystopian futures portrayed in novels like The Road. And this means learning from how economic diversity accompanies contexts that have long been subject to manifold vulnerabilities produced by colonial violence. One great example of this, I think, is the mapping of the microeconomic onto depictions of self and community, the capitalistic and the non-capitalistic, in Indra Sinha's 2007 novel about Bhopal, Animals People. This uses tropes of alchemy throughout in representing the ongoing social and environmental effects of chemical disaster, and features a whole range of community economies that transmute and counter the privations of poverty and abandonment. Um, there's lots more I could say about this in relation to kind of the, the uh, effects of chronic disaster, long-term, decades-long chronic disaster and community reconstruction, but I'll kind of leave that for, for maybe questions later on. Um, I, I read a book like um, Animals, People as giving a kind of hopeful counterpoint, and I think you need both, to a novel like Roberto Bolaño's 2666, which is set on the Mexican border city of Ciudad Juarez, um, and is the site of a complex assemblage of, um, of occult economies that relate directly to the depredations of NAFTA and deep structures of inequality, and that the book also allows us to trace in relation to colonialism. The world portrayed there is in many ways the shadowy obverse to Gibson Graham's intimations of economic possibility. But I think putting it in dialogue with the depiction of toxic capitalism and animals people can be generative for a couple of reasons. So first, it helps open up complementary perspectives on the potential for claiming alternative economic futures in relation to neoliberal exploitation and chronic violence, um, so both social and environmental. And second, this kind of comparatism does this in a way that produces a productive dialectic between the weak theory approach of Gibson Graham and the more systemic thinking found in the shock doctrine. So applying this method more broadly to differential definitions of disaster, such comparativism can also be helpful 
in highlighting the need for radically different epistemologies as well as managerial models from those that predominate in disaster studies scholarship. Um, so I'm thinking about kind of how disaster economy and community um, are represented as textured and very culturally specific ways in literary texts. Thanks. Um, there's also a chance here, I think, to integrate complementary portrayals of occult economies, both positive and negative, into a vision of health and sustainability that follows the progressive recent recommendations of worldwide bodies like the WHO, which is hardly renowned for its radical politics, and to situate social, environmental, and economic health as a nexus that's incompatible with free market fundamentalism. Crucially, such a broad-based emphasis on health which in turn relates to cultural and historical complications of post-disaster recovery, can provide conceptual resources to counter the medical model of shock that Klein draws on in connecting economic shock tactics in the mid-20th century development of electric shock treatment. In conjunction with this, comparative analysis of disaster representations and economic diversity can help provide a bulwark against disaster capitalism by reconfiguring its logic. In the opening to the shock doctrine, Klein quotes one of Milton Friedman's most influential early essays outlining the principles of disaster capitalism when he states, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. So cue shiver down the spine. Um, the resulting art artistry of the real, as Klein terms it, has been deliberately shocking and awesome in its speed, scale, and catastrophic success. However, if there is a hope in countering, the, in countering the disaster machine that is neoliberalism, one method is to turn this statement on its head and look to how the diversity of disaster-conditioned economic practices that are represented by post-colonial writers and artists can be read as giving form or even generic substance to the many emergent economic and environmental practices that correspond globally. And that's certainly how I see my own research on disaster is shaping up. And I hope it represents one way to support the work of claiming equitable and sustainable futures in contexts where compound disaster is constitutive of daily life. Thanks for listening.